Ugh, another pointless video call where nothing gets done. I think you're on mute, David. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. What did I miss? IT just approved Miro for the whole company. Miro? That's the... Online whiteboard. For team collaboration. We can make these long video meetings so much shorter with Miro boards. We can share ideas, feedback, and updates on them whenever. Actually see what we're talking about. It's all online. Miro will make our flexible work setup so much easier. With one virtual space for our brainstorms, projects, presentations. Oh, that sounds kind of amazing. So I don't need to wake up for 6 a.m. calls with the London office anymore. Now you're getting it. Don't let time zones get in the way of your team working well together. See why 99% of the Fortune 100 trust Miro to get good work done from anywhere. Get your first three boards free at Miro.com. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 200 The Marco Polo Bridge Incident Total War Comes to China. Last time, the Japanese North China Garrison Army, under Lieutenant General Kanichiro Tashiro, had clashed with the Chinese 29th Army, commanded overall by local warlord Sung Ju Yuen, near the Lugu Chiao, known in the West as the Marco Polo Bridge, in Wanping on July 7, 1937. The Wanping Fortress sits to the east of the bridge. The bridge itself was granite and carved with the heads of nearly 500 stone lions. Marco Polo himself, having seen it some time in the 13th century, during his 17 years in China, called it one of the finest bridges in the world. The local Chinese warlord Song had received from Chiang Kai-shek instructions of a sort, though he was his own man, to not give up any territory to the Japanese but at the same time, to do nothing to upset them, or worse, give them a reason to occupy the area. The loss of Manchuria to the northeast was bad enough, but to lose northern China, and that's what would happen if the Japanese succeeded here at Wanping, would allow the enemy access to central China. Moreover, just 21 kilometers to the east of the fortress was Beijing, or Beiping, a.k.a. Peking, which had been the capital of China for centuries, thus still held cultural and emotional significance for the Chinese people. Moreover, and what mattered right at this moment, was that Beijing was still a central rail hub, with lines running in all four directions. Whoever controlled it could rush troops in any direction along its railways. Which is why, on July 10th, the nationalist leader Chang wrote in his diary, This is the turning point, for existence or obliteration. The nationalist had moved the capital 1,000 kilometers, or 621 miles, to the south to Nanjing in 1928, and was, for now, safe. But again, if the Japanese took control of northern China, just below the Great Wall near the coast, central China would be open to them. All this left Chiang Kai-shek in a quandary when word reached him of this latest clash. At the moment, Chiang was not in Nanjing, but rather at a resort at Guling at Mount Lushan in the Jiang province, some 200 kilometers southwest of Nanjing. He had gone there for the last few summers to escape the heat, but at the same time would call his advisors there to work out a solution to the Japanese problem. For the last few years, the Japanese had made certain demands of the Chinese, even outside Manchuria, and generally, they were obeyed. This was becoming the norm. So each summer, Chang would deal with whatever crisis was of the moment, with a balance of maintaining face, but basically giving the stronger power what it wanted. It helped that with each clash, Generally, the situation would shortly calm down, as Japan knew it was not yet strong enough to effectively deal with all of China. But when word came of the fighting at the Marco Polo Bridge, Chang, already with his military advisors, was considering a more robust response. 
In times past, the line of questioning in his head normally played out as follows. Is this latest clash a minor fight, or were the Japanese finally coming after northern China to add on to Manchukuo? After all, the area in question wasn't really under his control. Not directly. Ruling it was a hodgepodge of local warlords, really Chang's military rivals, and of course, the Japanese, though mostly indirectly. So if the fighting escalated there, he, Chang, was none the worse for wear. The warlords and the Japanese could kill each other, leaving the nationalists free to grow and strengthen as Chang's two German officers trained his officer corps. But those warlords would be needed, eventually, if China as a whole ever truly wanted to expel the Japanese. So, was it a good idea to allow them to be slaughtered? In other words, was it time for Chang, for China, to declare war on Japan? If the answer was yes, China would be mostly on its own. Germany and Italy, now ruled by their own warlords, were intimidating the rest of Europe and North Africa, grabbing what territory they could. The USSR was in the middle of Stalin's Great Purge, where millions would die, certainly many within its officer corps. And the Republican government in Spain was currently being challenged by General Franco and his nationalists, so for them, the outside world did not exist. This left the United States, but it wasn't in any shape to help either. At the time, its president, Franklin Roosevelt, was battling Congress to pack the Supreme Court, so his measures attempting to help the jobless would not be struck down. No, if Chang made a launch at the Japanese military, he was on his own, and that meant relying on his own troops. The next logical questions for him were, how long could his men hold out, and how many Japanese casualties would it take before they retreated back to Manchukuo? The likely answers to those questions were, not very long, and way, way too many. But the question of whether to escalate the current situation wasn't only in Chiang Kai-shek's hands. Just one month before the clash at the Marco Polo Bridge, a new prime minister had been installed in Tokyo, Prince Kanoye Fumimaro. Kanoye had been a diplomat for a long time. He had, in fact, been present at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. And after watching the European powers try to dominate each other and focus mostly on their part of the world, he realized that Asia would never be treated as an equal. So Kanoye also met with his cabinet when word came of this most recent fighting. However, its members, not waiting to see what he said, put forward their own ideas and were thus split as to a reaction. Senior General Staff Officer Mutu Akira and the Chief of the Military Affairs Department of the War Ministry, Tanaka Shienchi, both pushed for not only an escalation, but a larger goal of crushing, once and for all, Chang's government. But balancing them out was Ishihara Kanji, head of the operations division of the general staff. He advised caution. Strangely, Ishihara had been the one pushing hardest in taking over Manchuria in 1931, but now his view had modified but not out of respect for human life. Simply, with battles still raging in Manchukuo, if the Japanese widened that conflict to include northern China, they then left themselves open to an attack from Soviet Russia, never mind Stalin's great purges. If the Japanese military was suddenly faced with three fronts, then the coming days and months could go very hard for them. Chiang Kai-shek would say in the coming years that he needed at least 50 million casualties in order to be taken seriously by the West. Japan could not afford such losses and still remain in the fight. Two days after the initial clash at the bridge, on July 9th, the Japanese minister of war, Su Giyama Gen, known to be weak, asked for five divisions to attack North China. His request was denied by the Prime Minister for the moment. Meanwhile, 
as had happened before, the men actually doing the fighting, on both sides, started talking to each other about a ceasefire. Unbeknownst to them, Chang wrote in his diary the next day, We've already sent troops north. Perhaps we can restrain their ambitions. If we do not show preparation and determination, then we can't resolve this peacefully. As covered previously, the first clash between the Japanese, while on maneuvers, and some of the Chinese forces stationed outside the walled Wanping took place at 11 p.m. on July 7th. A few hours later, a small group of Japanese infantry tried to get over one section of the wall, yet they were pushed back. What followed two hours later was a demand by the Japanese to be allowed to search inside the town for their missing man. But this was ignored. That's when Qing Duchun, acting commander of the Chinese 29th Route Army, sent a message to General Fang Jian of the Chinese 37th Division, ordering him to place his troops on high alert. At 2 a.m. on July 8th, just hours after the shooting stopped, the mayor of Wangping attempted negotiations with the Japanese, inside their own camp. But nothing came of it. Two hours later, at 4 a.m., reinforcements, requested by both sides, began to arrive. As the mayor left the Japanese camp and returned to Wangping, he saw many Japanese troops surrounding his city. It was now 4.45 a.m., July 8th. Five minutes later, the Chinese now reinforced, but probably not knowing of the Japanese reinforcements, opened fire on enemy units at the Marco Polo Bridge and just to the north of it. The Japanese, responding to being fired upon, attacked, but the Chinese defenders held the bridge, yet they paid a heavy price for it. Skirmishes continued throughout the night. The next morning, another ceasefire was agreed to, but as the Japanese were pulling back, they were fired upon again. It was believed by some of those Japanese officers on the scene much later, and by some of Chang's officers, that this particular shooting was carried out by Chinese communist forces, trying to instigate a full-scale war between the two sides. The truth, of course, will probably never be known. Hello everyone, Ray here. As every manager knows, the right person in the right position can make all the difference, and that's why you need ZipRecruiter. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100-plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash World War. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash World War. One more time to try for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash World War. Back in Tokyo, Prime Minister Prince Kanoye agreed to a plan put forth by the Army Chief of Staff, who advised non-expansion, and settling this issue locally. The troops were to be pulled back. But at a subsequent meeting of the Army General Staff, some of the expansionist members pushed forth a plan to send additional troops to North China, but only to teach the nationalists a lesson, and then to pull out. Only after hours of talking was peace re-established on July 9th at Wanping near the bridge. Then someone lit off a series of firecrackers. Immediately, both sides started firing on each other, believing the other side had just started another attack. This time, two high-ranking officers from each side, who had known each other for years and had established trust, reinstituted the truce. 
In the ceasefire treaty, Sung Chien agreed to apologize to the Japanese, subdue any communists in the area, and pull his men back from the bridge. General Hashimoto agreed not to bring any additional forces into the area. Thus was peace once again established. But when Sung sent word to Chang about their agreement, he erupted with anger. He told Sung to send in additional troops anyway, but the officer on the spot did not, sticking to his honorable agreement. However, communications with Tokyo was so bad that the government there believed that Chang was still sending in reinforcements. Therefore, on July 17th, it released a statement demanding that Chang halt any more reinforcements heading towards North China. Chang reacted bitterly to this, saying, If we allow one more inch of our territory to be lost, then we shall be guilty of committing an unpardonable crime, even at the expense of war. And once war has begun, there is no looking back. Now, this statement is rather out of character for the nationalist leader. Politically, he was brilliant, and he had learned at the feet of Sun Yat-sen. So the question really is, had he lost his temper, or was this statement simply for the masses, attempting to rouse the nation, while at the same time showing the Japanese his resolve? Either way, his statement struck a chord among the Japanese civilians. One editorial read, Japan has no choice but to cross the Rubicon. But then, the real situation near the Marco Polo Bridge, that peace had been restored, reached Tokyo. The transfer orders of more Japanese troops was cancelled. Konoye assumed, like his generals, that Chang would adhere to his side of the agreement as well. But Chang stayed silent, neither confirming nor disregarding the agreement. This left the soldiers on both sides, around the bridge and Wang Ping, tense. Almost three weeks went by, and the men did not know if they were at war or not, never conducive to calming nerves. So the inevitable happened. On the night of July 25th, Japanese forces attacked Beijing a.k.a. Peking, and Tianjin to the southeast near the coast. Bombers were sent over Tianjin, dropping incendiary bombs. The fire spread quickly. Japanese forces then moved in. The city fell on July 30th. Beijing fell two days earlier, as the invading forces there had just been reinforced. Now in charge locally of the Japanese forces, of the Japanese North Garrison Army, was Lieutenant General Kiyoshi Katsuki. The man he replaced had been a longtime friend of Song the Warlord. But this meant now there would no longer be talks with a view of deflecting an all-out war. General Katsuki sent word back to Tokyo, but lying through his teeth, saying he had tried mightily to work out another peace with the Chinese. As such, he was asking for a blank check to safeguard all Japanese lives and property in the area. His military superiors said yes, and then sent two additional divisions, one to Shanghai and the other to Tianjin. Yet there are sources that say that the Japanese were purposefully building up for an attack in the area that the areas around Beijing and Tianjin had to be taken, if only to secure Manchuria further north, as well as Korea due east. And General Katsuki sincerely believed he was being sent to punish the upstart Chinese. Prime Minister Kanoye told the military that this would all be over in three months. The Chinese would see the error of their ways and accept Japanese dominance, if only for their own security. The next day, he told the people of Japan a modified version of this, that order had been brought to northern China. Without knowing it, Kanoye had just unofficially declared total war on China. General Katsuki's forces moved swiftly. The Japanese North Garrison Army gobbled up city after city within the triangle made by Beijing Tianjin to the southeast closer to the coast, and Baoding due west of Tianjin, 
see the cover photo for this episode. China, having nothing to lose, appealed to the League of Nations. It promised to investigate and produce a report. But President Roosevelt of the United States would go on to surprise both sides with a damning statement comparing the Japanese to the Nazis and fascists of Europe. Later, on October 5, 1937, he said, When an epidemic of physical disease starts to spread, the community joins in a quarantine of the patients in order to protect the health of the community. In other words, he was comparing Japan to a disease that needed to be quarantined until it died out or, at the very least, grew weak enough and was forced back to its original borders. His fellow Americans applauded this benign statement, but U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Joseph Grew, who knew the country well, believed that the president had just made a mistake. The Japanese did not have a culture of halfway measures. They either did something, or they did not. Risking war with them over anything in China, or even all of China, to Grew's thinking, invited trouble of the First Order. But it must be remembered that FDR, when a younger man, had read and practically memorized Admiral Alfred Mahon's The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, and as such could see where Japan's strength and weakness lay. Of course, that did not take into consideration Japan's culture, which respected force above all else. But FDR and the world was about to be introduced to Yosuke Masuoka, a diplomat. He was the former vice consul at the Japanese consulate in Shanghai and currently the president of the South Manchuria Railway. He spoke up for his country and against the American president by saying, And what country in its expansion era has ever failed to be trying to its neighbors? Ask the American Indian or the Mexican, how trying the young United States used to be. He went on to say that Japan's goals were to stop the white man from dominating Asia and to save China, and thereby the rest of Asia, from communism. That Japan's expansion was natural, like the growth of a child. Only one thing stops a child from growing. Death. In general terms, Japan had believed up until this moment, that the United States, with its lofty goals of independence and self-determination, had been the last neutral country towards it, as when Teddy Roosevelt had brokered a peace deal during the Russo-Japanese War. But if the United States sought to limit Japan's growth, then not only would this fail, but it would not help China in the least. Further, if China continued to resist Japan, basing its hopes on the Americans, then its suffering would only continue, and that would be the fault of Washington. Getting back to Chiang, he refused to send out any part of his central army. For now, those in charge of the area, like the local warlords, were on their own. However, he did send one ally, General Tang Enbo, to the region. But Tang was not given any first-rate soldiers. Chang was saving them for the very real possible coming war. Despite the fact that the Guangdong army in Manchuria had some 90,000 troops that could be sent south, General Tang did his best with his own men, fighting to save Nanko, 20 miles or 32 kilometers northwest of Beijing. But after losing 26,000 men, he was forced to pull back. By August, the area in question was overwhelmed and lost. Yet Chang had another option, the one he was loath to consider. He could coordinate military actions with the communists. In fact, just after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, Mao Zedong, the communist leader, had sent several representatives to Chang, such as Zhou Enlai, Zhu De, and Ling Bao. This was joined by a public statement from Mao declaring that if Chang mobilized with the goal of pushing out the Japanese, the communists would give their all in the service of their country under your leadership, Mr. Chairman. But as there had been an on-and-off war between the nationalists and the communists for the last ten years, 
trust was non-existent. Mao preached cooperation, but Chiang wanted assimilation. But the communist leader would never go for that. Still, a compromise had to be reached, or both sides, in their turn, would be destroyed by the foreign enemy. And Chiang knew this. The nationalist leader reluctantly agreed and allowed the communist to set up a military headquarters. Mao responded by saying the CCP would provide 45,000 men, with another 10,000 to hold key areas in the north. These men were designated by Mao as the 8th Route Army. Chang agreed to this, but realized he was inviting the devil into his home. On August 2nd, Chang legalized the Red Army. The Civil War for China was put on hold. Sort of. Now that this unpleasant business was done with, Chang sought to invite another devil into China, the Russians. If he could get a non-aggression pact with Stalin, then the two Chinese forces could focus solely on the Japanese. Of course, the war between Chang and Mao did not stop, but merely shifted into another form. Right away, Mao attempted to betray the communists as the truly patriotic party while hinting that Chang's was a policy of appeasement and weakness. Still, it was done, and the Japanese now had to be dealt with. Returning to Nanjing on August 7th, several high-ranking communists, such as Zhou Enlai, Red Army Marshal Zhu De, and General Yi Jianying, met with Chang and his advisors to work out an organized approach to overall strategy and tactics. The communists made it clear that their best weapon, as Chang well knew, was guerrilla tactics, and as such, they would begin harassing the enemy's fixed positions and supply lines. Chang, when he spoke up, aimed for something loftier. If we can win this war, he declared, then we can revive the country and turn danger into security. But if China loses a war with Japan, then I fear it may take decades even centuries, to revive it. He then chastised those of his advisors that had previously urged him to give up on Manchuria, as they hoped it would appease Tokyo. He hoped now that they knew better. So, comrades, Chang said, we need a decision. Do we fight, or shall we be destroyed? The intellectuals came over to his side, stating China has come to a crisis point. Only through war can we seek survival. There's no possibility of a conditional peace. With this out of the way, Chang got down to brass tacks. Their capital, Nanjing, had to be on Japan's radar if all-out war came. The bureaucrats' families had to be evacuated. The general public had to be evacuated. The rail lines leading to Nanjing had to be secured. It was time for them to consider the discipline of the enemy, and take on such measures themselves, because before them was an almost impossible task. If they were to win, it wouldn't be because of tanks and planes and machine guns, but because of their spiritual power. After all, as Chang told his audience, compared with the Japanese level of preparation, it's not that we are not 10% as prepared, we're not even 1% as prepared. No wonder the general population is panicking. All generals and officials must face up to their responsibilities. The Chinese were going to war, but so too were the Japanese. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to ramble on. Please feel free to just stop now and uh, and get on with your lives. Uh, last weekend, I saw the film Dunkirk uh, with my friend Jesse. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I walked into that movie determined to hate it. Why, do you ask? Well, it's simple. I had... Up to that point, when I heard Christopher Nolan was going to do this movie, I had a 67-page movie script that I was working on for Dunkirk. And when I heard that he was doing it, I said some bad words, 
threw it in a drawer and, and forgot about it. So anyway, um, I've picked another subject to work on. So I'm doing something a lot smaller and I'll see if I can make something come of it. But anyway, I walked into this movie theater determined to hate it. And I was ready to punch Christopher. I ever saw him. Not that I ever will. Anyway, so I go in there and, um, I've got, I got my bad attitude, but I've got my popcorn. So I'm okay. But, um, I, I was, after I got over myself, which is sometimes hard to do, uh, I was impressed. The visuals were amazing, staggering. I realized, uh, I read that he uh, used some of the real planes that were used then and some of the, the boats and ships as well. Um, that, that was staggering. Uh, the way he played with the timeline, I thought was fascinating. It took me, uh, you know, it took me a little while as it was supposed to, to figure out what he was doing. Um, the sense that you get um, for the pilots, uh, for for the civilians in, in the ships, and obviously, of course, the men on the beach and their absolute fear and frustrations, and the fact that the Germans were just right there. In fact, the first like five minutes of the movie, you you know, it really sets it up well that they are right there, and they could have went in, but you know, of course, as we have seen, Hitler uh, halted the tanks and halted the men. Um, at I was I was trying very hard to be disappointed on how narrowly he focused it in the script that I was writing, which still hurts to talk about. Uh, I was I was trying to cover a heck of a lot more of the initial eleven days. Um, who knows if it would have worked out if it would have been a three and a half hour film? But anyway, um, but once I got over myself and I got Jesse to talk to me about it and, and give me his um, unbiased opinion, I I I really let myself relax and enjoy it. So again, just hats off to him and the incredible uh, job that he did. Um, so I, I enjoyed it a lot, but not at first because of my own bitterness. But anyway, uh, so if you haven't checked it out, if you really want to get a sense of what it was like for those guys, I mean, it was just 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 the realism. He, he did that very well. Uh, future note to Christopher, don't put, what's that kid's name from that band? Harry, Henry Styles. It's too distracting, so don't put him in there. But anyway, um, I enjoyed it a lot. And um, and once I get my script written about another thing that I'm not going to mention, at least someone take it away, maybe uh, I can do something with that. But again, uh, I'm finally glad, I'm glad that I finally get to see it and, and, and enjoyed my experience. And while I'm rambling here, I'm just going to throw something out that um, I probably should have said a very long time ago, but I don't think I have. I honestly can't remember. It's been 200 episodes in. So, um, ironically, I obviously I hate Nazis and I hate what they stand for. And we just had all that hubbub and, uh, what happened in Charlottesville, 30 minutes from my house where I work, um, go on, which I'll probably talk about in a minute cause I can't help myself. But when I was 12 years old, thereabouts, I found the show Hogan's Heroes, and I immediately fell in love with the German language. I don't know why, it's just the way my brain works. I just thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world. So I studied it best I could. Now, keep in mind, this is the late 70s, so there's no internet and stuff like that. So I'm finding out all I can about the language, about the country, about its history, and I just really fell in love with um, its, its contributions as far as literature and science. Uh, mathematics, um, art, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, you can't help but stumble across World War II if you're studying German history. So it just truly saddened me, saddened me. Sorry, it's really early in the morning here. Um, the country that I loved, and I don't know why, you, you, it's just one of those things that you come across it and you immediately are fascinated with it, that it was a part of and responsible for, for such um, horrific uh, events. So as I go through this podcast, um, and of course, that's when my fascination with World War II started. When I go through this podcast, it's it's very strange for me because I still love Germany. I still love its culture and, and language and, and things like that um, to go through here and to do this knowing what they did and what the rest of the world had to fight against to stop them. So it, it's always ironic for me whenever I put out an episode and at the same time, when it comes to the, the Pacific theater, you know, I'm a typical American. I was taught about Pearl Harbor and the stabbing in the back and the, and all the, um, the evilness that we were told Japan was obviously it's a lot more complex than that. Um, FDR really put them in a box and we'll get into all that 
uh, kind of thing later. But so as we go through this, I just think it's very strange that on one hand, I have to chastise a country that I love. And on the other hand, in the Pacific, I have to be fair and balanced, no pun intended, um, when I'm talking about Japan, because in my head, it's, it's all, when it comes to Japan, it's all emotional. It's not, it's not logical. It's not facts and dates and things like that. So, um, so if I slip up every once in a while and I just go over the edge when it comes to talking about the Japanese, I apologize, but I am cognizant of my feelings and the programming that I got as a young kid. And I will do the best I can to be, uh, to be fair and just. Um, it's, uh, what, what day is it? It is August 13th, 2017, and some of you have been watching the news, um, what's going on in Charlottesville, Virginia. I work uh, down there. Um, I I knew this was going to happen. I mean, I didn't know exactly how it was going to happen, but you can't have several thousand people that hate come together and not have something bad happen. So the family was sent away um, because the road that these people have to travel on to and from Charlottesville, because most of them are from North Carolina, come pretty close to my house. So I just figured it'd be best to send the family away. But anyway, for those of you who watched it, I mean, it was horrific. It's still going on. The one person's dead. The two cops are dead. There's just been a lot of clashes. A lot of people are going to be sent to the hospital. I work in a clinic where they repair faces from car accidents and things like that. I'm sure we'll see those people over the next uh, couple of weeks because there was a lot of people cut and, and things like that. Um, I do not understand what it would take. You, you would have to be pretty angry to carry around a swastika. You would have to be pretty angry or afraid uh, to, to give the Nazi salute. And there was plenty of that in this rally uh, over the weekend. I, I don't know. They weren't hugged enough by their parents or whatever, or they read into the propaganda. I am... Um, I know people who read this stuff and, and believe it wholeheartedly, and I just try not to engage with them um, as much as I can. But j just to put it out there, I am from Charleston, South Carolina. I mean, you know, the, the home of the Civil War. And I was taught all the messages of, of hate, of fear, of being superior, of, of everything that you could possibly imagine um, the Confederacy was about. I mean, I was, I was in... I was right there and at ground zero, but my father didn't believe that way. And so we didn't hear it from him. I heard it from everybody else, everybody else around me, but not from him. And I read a lot of books as a child. And so doing that, you just, um, um the knowledge that you get from reading combats the stupidity that you hear on the streets. And I just have to imagine that Dylan Roof, the young man who shot up the people in the church in North Charleston, where I used to live, um, probably wasn't much of a book reader. And if it was, if he was, it was pretty a lot of hate speech. But anyway, what these people stand for or what they're willing to do is is totally beyond my ability to comprehend. Um, and it's just sad to know that we're not, we haven't made much progress uh, over the years. We have, but when people do things like this, it's just, I don't know, it's staggering. Um, so yeah, I'm rambling at this point. I apologize. Um, just for those of you who do not live in the United States, um, those people are not representative of Virginia. Uh, they're certainly not representative of Charlottesville. Charlottesville is, um, a very, uh, international city because of the University of Virginia, because of the hospital, because of other fine universities in the area, James Madison University, VCU, and Richmond, that kind of stuff. Um, just, just know that that's not us. In fact, if you want the truth, most of these people are from North Carolina, where racism is alive and well, based on a friend who lived there for 15 years before he moved out. Um, he was shocked every day by what he saw and heard, but he had a job, and so he had to stay there. Anyways, just, just know that it's, it's, I don't know, every, every society has its fringes. And I guess when they come to the surface, it's, it's not, it's not always easy to remember that they don't represent the majority of the people. So that's it. I'm done. I'm just, I've been stuck to the news all weekend long, watching these people live on TV and just very, very emotional and just see people walking in the streets with torches and then you know, to remember what happened in Nazi Germany. It's just too much of a, 
it's a lot to wrap your head around. So, so take care, everyone.